Hello everybody, sorry I'm not there today, but I am uh, sick with the flu and an ear infection. So uh, if you're going to go open your notebook, put this title on the table of contents, and put it on the top of the next page of notes, box it in, put the day's date on there, and we'll go ahead and begin. So thermodynamics. If you rub your hands together for 15 seconds, what happens to them? Alright, they get warm. Why is that? Well, because of thermal energy and because of friction. All the little grooves and bumps in your skin rub past one another that causes friction and therefore you have thermal energy. Uh, Thermodynamics is the study of the effects of work, heat, flow, and energy on a system, movement of thermal energy. Engineer, engineers use thermodynamics in systems ranging from nuclear power plants to electrical components. So obviously rocket launch here, a lot of thermodynamics going on there, a lot of heat. Um, nuclear power plants, all you see there is steam leaving the towers, That's, those are cooling towers. Um, so just different examples of thermodynamic systems. Uh, thermal energy versus temperature, you need to write both these definitions down, this is very important, so you can pause it if you need to write these down. But thermal energy is connect energy in transit from one object to another due to temperature difference measured in joules. Temperature is the average kinetic energy of particles in an object, not the total amount of kinetic energy particles, and that is measured in degrees. So we're more familiar with temperature, uh, obviously Fahrenheit, but in the metric system they use Celsius. Uh, thermal energy might be something new to you, and that is actually the kinetic energy in transit. So shown here in the diagram, if you have two vessels uh, that are connected to one another, then eventually the thermal energy from one will travel to the other, and then their temperatures will uh, balance out. Uh, you'll need to write this uh, table down to know our different scales. So in Celsius, water freezes at zero degrees, boils at 100. Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Fahrenheit for freezing, 212 for boiling. And then Kelvin, which is the other metric scale besides Celsius, is 273K is the point of freezing water, and 373K the boiling point of water. Uh, matter is made up of molecules in motion, kinetic energy. So you know molecules are always moving. And then an increase in temperature means they have a more uh, motion, so increase in motion. A decrease in temperature, so they cool down, the molecules slow down, so there's a decrease in motion. Absolute zero, please write this down, occurs when all kinetic energy is removed from an object. So that's zero Kelvin or negative 273 degrees Celsius. And I've looked it up before, and I know you may not know what Kelvin is or um, how cold negative 273 uh, Celsius is, but when you change that to Fahrenheit, that gives us a better idea. And so for Fahrenheit people, that would be negative 459.67 degrees Fahrenheit. That obviously is very, very cold. When we thought negative 51 chill was cold, try negative 459. Okay? So at this point, absolute zero, it's theoretically thought that all molecular motion stops. No one's sure what would happen when molecular motion stops, because we have never accomplished absolute zero or zero K. Uh, it's just been theorized. We've gotten pretty close to it, but we have never actually hit zero K. Um, these are some conversion factors you want, or some, um, yeah, so you want to write these down to get from temperature Kelvin, uh, from Celsius, you just add 273, that's not too bad. Uh, TR, that's actually temperature Rankine. So if you think about it, Celsius and Fahrenheit are the two main scales we use in the two uh, different systems of measurement. Uh, Kelvin is going to be the absolute scale for the metric system. Rankin is the absolute scale for Fahrenheit, which we really don't see Rankin much unless you take aerospace, but um, it would be good to know that. So to get temperature in Rankin, you take the Fahrenheit and add 460 to it. To get Fahrenheit from Celsius, you have to multiply it times 9 fifths, 9 fifths and add 32. To get Celsius from Fahrenheit, you subtract 32 and then divide by 1.8. So you want to go ahead and jot all those down. Um, convert 1K to Fahrenheit. So take the 1K. Subtract 273, that'll give you Celsius first, and then take the Celsius, plug that in, that's negative 272, 272 degrees Celsius, times 9 fifths, plus 32, and you get a temperature Fahrenheit of negative 457.6. So you see that's very, very cold for us. Thermal equilibrium is obtained when touching objects within the system reach the same temperature. So like all equilibrium, things reach balance. Uh, when thermal equilibrium is reached, the system loses ability to do work. Because thermal energy is the mover here. So if thermal energy, if, if, they're, if they're in equilibrium, there's no more push anymore. There's no force. So you lose the ability to do work. Um, 
And you want to go and write this down also. Zero off law of thermodynamics. If two systems are separately fo found to be in thermal equilibrium with the third system, the first two systems are in thermal equilibrium with each other, which that kind of makes sense. If one and two are equilibrium and two and three are, then they're all in equilibrium. But uh, the zero off law of thermodynamics describes that. So if you want to go and write these two down, thermal equilibrium and zero off law. And you can pause it if you need to. Uh, thermal energy, heat transfer, the transfer movement of thermal energy, most common types of transfer. So there's convection, conduction, and radiation. And we're going to go each one of these uh, individually here in a minute. 100% uh, efficiency is unattainable, like always, in all of our systems, conversions, uh, units. Uh, you never get 100% or better, ever, in the real world. If you did, then you did something wrong. Uh, and all processes are irreversible. First law, go and write this down. Law of energy conservation applied to thermal system. Thermal energy can change form and location, but it cannot be created or destroyed. Thermal energy can be increased with the system by adding thermal energy, heat, or by performing work in a system. That's very important. You can only increase thermal energy by adding thermal energy or performing work in a system. Okay, so I'm going to jot all that down for the first law. And you see here, cooking a turkey in an oven. Uh, then they have the uh, forest fire here, atomic bomb going off, and then even when you throw a bowling ball down the lane and hit the pins, believe it or not, there's still thermal energy going on there uh, in that uh, reaction. Uh, first law of thermodynamics example, using a bicycle pump, pump on the handle results in what? Well, you apply mechanical energy into the system, so as you raise and lower the bar over and over again, mechanical energy is converted into thermal energy through friction, the pump becomes hot. Well, not really hot, but probably, you know, warm. The total increase in internal energy of the system is equal to what? And that is the applied mechanical energy. Second law. Go ahead and write this down. Pretty simple. Thermal energy flows from hot to cold. So you see the ice melted in there in the little animation. Um, so when you touch a frozen pizza with your hand, thermal energy flows in what direction? Well, our hand should be warmer than the pizza, so it should flow from hand to pizza. When you touch a cooked pizza with your hand, thermal energy flows in what direction? Well, the should be one second. Sorry, I had to pause for a second. That was my wife on the phone. When you touch a cooked pizza, obviously the pizza coming out of the oven should be warmer than your hand, so therefore it should flow from pizza to ham. So I get a question a lot of time about this one. Like I said, well, if you take a cold soda water bottle and put it in the, the classroom, it feels like if you put your hand near the bottle, you can feel the cold air coming off of it. And that's not true. Um, remember, it's flowing from hot to cold. Um, it, what you're actually feeling is the absence of the heat around that bottle. Kind of like if you stood in front of your window on a very, very cold Iowa winter day, you feel like it's cold air in front of the window, and that's not really true. The air's not escaping out, or right, actually the air is escaping out the window, but it's going hot to cold. That's where you're losing the thermal energy from your house through the window. And so once again, what you're feeling there is the absence of heat in front of that window or door. Uh, another example is when you like turn your AC on your car and it blows cold air in your face, uh, what actually it's doing in, your, in, the, in the dashboard, what's going on, you can't see it, is the um, your AC compressor and all the hoses and uh, conditors and stuff like that are actually pulling the heat from the air, kind of like exchange system, and then blowing that air that's had the heat removed from it into your face. It's not really blowing cold air, it's just blowing the absence of heat into your face. Um, entropy, you need, you need to jot this down, is the measure of how evenly attributed heat is within a system. System tends to go from order to disorder. So you see the firewood all stacked up here, nice and pretty. Uh, that is order. And then what's on fire, that is disorder. Firewood has a low entropy, molecules in order when stacked, and high entropy when burning, molecules in disorder. The total amount of energy in the world is not changed, but the availability of that energy constantly decreases. Uh, convection. Here's our first transfer system. You can write this down. It is the transfer of energy, uh, energy by movement of fluid, liquid, or gas. If you want to underline two words, movement and fluid. It has to be liquid or gas, so a fluid, and it has to be moving to be considered convection. If it's just a fluid just sitting there, then that is not convection by definition. So be careful on that. When fluid is heated, it expands, becomes less dense, and rises. Think about hotter balloons, right? That's how they work. The air molecules uh, get excited, they move around a little bit more, they bump away from each other. They expand, and therefore, they become less dense, and so the hot air rises. Uh, boiler heating systems regulate heat throughout a home without pumps through the use of convection. So you have an older house or a building, they'll have a boiler down in the basement. They boil the water and send that warm water through these pipes. It goes to the radiator, and then those radiators, of course, give off the heat. And that is the fluid moving through the system, but also the air moving through the room also that lets that heat transfer or move around. 
conduction is the next type, so go ahead and write this down. The transfer of thermal energy within an object or between objects from molecule to molecule. Now they show a bowl of soup. You're probably thinking, well, he just said fluids is going to be convection. But remember, it has to be moving fluids. Well, obviously, the soup in your bowl shouldn't be moving, at least not too fast. Um, so therefore, this is by conduction because it is by the contact of molecules. The soup molecules, all the things in the soup, the carrots and peas and noodles, whatever else that are warm, touching the spoon, then transfer the energy from themselves to the spoon, and that makes the spoon and the bowl warmer all by contact. So a metal spoon placed in a hot cup of soup will feel warm to your hand. The heat from the soup is conducted through the spoon. Remember, it's not a moving fluid, therefore it is conduction. And they need to write down this equation along with the uh, variables and units. Units are a big part in this. So notice we have Q, energy transfer in joules. M is the mass of material in kilograms. C is the specific heat capacity of the material. Joule per kilogram degree Celsius. And then delta T, that's uh, capital T, because we can see lowercase t here in a minute. So don't get those two mixed up. But capital T is going to be the change of temperature, and that is in degrees Celsius. So we have Q equals MC delta T. Um, I would at least jot down the first two equations on the left for P. You can get the K equation if you want to, but all it is is the middle equation uh, that's been rearranged to solve for K. But write these two equations down, and also the other variables you don't have down yet. So P is the rate of energy transfer in watts. Q is equal to the energy transfer in joules. Uh, delta T, lowercase t here, is the change in time in seconds. K is thermal conductivity in joule per, um, that is second uh, meter degree Celsius. And A is area of thermal conductivity, meter squared. L is thickness of material, so you might thickness of a wall or anything like that, maybe meters. And then once again, we already saw cap delta capital T, and that is difference in temperature. So, calculating energy transfer. So what we have here is a metal block being placed into water. Let's calculate the energy transferred when a block of aluminum at 80 degrees Celsius is placed in a 1 liter or 1 kilogram of water. At 25 degrees Celsius, it, um, the final temperature becomes 30 degrees Celsius. So, list all known values. We know the mass of the water, they told us, was 1 kilogram. We don't care about liter, that's volume. The heat capacity of water, they didn't tell us that, but they'll, we'll need to f uh, find it somewhere. So it should be given. 4,184 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. Change in temperature. It's going to be 5 because 30 minus 25, so 5 degrees Celsius. Specific heat of aluminum is 900 joules per, per, per kilogram, sorry, uh, degrees Celsius. And then change in temperature for the aluminum is going to be um, delta TAL. It's going to be 80 minus 30, and that is 50 degrees Celsius. So the water changed 5 degrees, and the aluminum changed 50 degrees. Unknown values, we don't know Q, and we don't know the mass aluminum block. So we don't know the energy transfer to the mass. The equation we're going to use for this are the Q equals MC delta T. And then also we have the equilibrium equation. So it says all the heat that's lost by the aluminum equals the heat gained by the water. So that way we can set each other equal to one another. So Q for the water is going to be 1,000 uh, kilo, I'm sorry, 1 kilogram times 4,184 joules per kilogram degree Celsius times 5 degrees Celsius difference. Uh, that gives us 20,920 joules gain. Therefore, that means aluminum had to lose that much. So, now we solve for the mass. So, we know Q is going to be the 20,920 joules. Uh, we're trying to solve for mass aluminum. So you see that over here on the left now. Um, so, we have QAL uh, divided by CAL times delta T. So, we have the 20,920 joules. That's what was lost by the aluminum. 900 uh, joules per kilogram degree Celsius is the specific heat of aluminum, and then there was a difference of 50 degrees Celsius for the aluminum. So we plug that in, multiply and divide, and we get 0.46 kilograms was the mass of that aluminum block. Okay? If you have any questions, you can go back and look at that, or ask me when I come back to class on Tuesday, hopefully. Um, here, we want to calculate energy transfer through a wall. So it says calculate the energy transfer in a wall, section measuring 2 meters by 1 by 0.04 meters thick with thermal conductivity of 0.1 joule per um, second meter degree Celsius. Opposing side of the wall section have a temperature of 10 degrees Celsius and 5 degrees Celsius after one hour. So all known values. Area of thermal conductivity, it told us it's 2 meter by 1 meter, so that's 2 meters squared. Thermal conductivity, that told us that was 0 0.10 joule per second meter degree Celsius. Thickness material, it was 0.04 meters, that's thickness of the wall. 
the temperature difference, uh, 10 degrees to 5 degrees, so it's 5 degrees difference Celsius. And then change in time, they say it was for one hour, but we need that in seconds, so one hour is 3,600 seconds. Because there's 60 minutes an hour and 60 seconds in a minute. Unknown, we don't know P, the rate of energy transfer, or Q, energy transfer. So select equations to solve unknown values. We have P equals Q divided by delta T, and that's the change in time. And then we have P is equal to Ka delta T, change in temperature, divided by L, thickness. So we're going to use the Ka delta T L one first. And we're going to plug in our uh, K, which is 0.1. Area was 2 meters squared. Temperature difference was 5 degrees. And then divided by 0.04 meters, that was the thickness. And we get 25 watts. And here you're probably thinking, well, watts? When I hear watts, I think about light bulbs. Well, it's the, the, the same kind of uh, thing we're talking about here. It's the energy transfer. So, to solve for Q now, now we can use this equation. We already know P. We know delta T. We can rearrange the equation to solve for Q. So Q is going to be P times delta T. So we use 25 watts we just found times 3600 seconds, and we get 90,000 joules. And that's the answer for that one. Uh, U value, the coefficient of heat conductivity, the measure of abilities, uh, material's ability to conduct heat. We're going to write that down, also get the equation. That is U is equal to P over A delta T. Uh, metric system, you want to write these units down. You have watt per meter squared degree Celsius. U.S. customary system is BTU per foot squared times hour times degree Fahrenheit. And BTU stands for British Thermal Unit, which is funny because they don't use that system anymore because they have gone metric, but we still use it here in America. I'm write all of that down. R value is the opposite of U value, so it's thermal resistance of a material. The measure of material's ability to resist E, the higher the R value, the higher the resistance. You can write that down. And also the equation, pretty simple. It's just R equals 1 divided by U. Uh, bulk R value, so if you look at different objects, you would add those together. So R value object 1 plus R value object 2 plus so forth and so forth would give you the total R value. So here we see... Uh, a cut through of a house, of a wall of a house, basically, determine the R value of the wall cavity below. So if you see on the outside of the house over here on the right side, you have brick they have to go through first, then a small air gap, a one inch air space, and we do not, even that has an R value. Then you go through this uh, foil face uh, polysinograte, then you go through fiberglass bat, because we have fiberglass on our walls to help insulate our homes, and then you have 5 8 uh, inch drywall or uh, gypsum board. So in a wall cavity location, you'd have to have all these R values to go through it to see how much that adds up to. Um, so you'd have 0.56. They're going the other direction. They're going from the house, inside the house out. So 0.56 plus 19 for the fiberglass bat plus the one inch full faced is 7.2. Even the air gap has 0.17. And then the brick itself is only 0.8. And they had the air gap in here just so that way moisture does get behind the bricks. It doesn't, it has place to breathe and that way it doesn't have mold and mildew grow between your house and the bricks so it lets the water run down and of course run out and give a little air separation there um, so that total R um, value for the wall cavity is 27.7 uh, for that total value there now if you know anything about housing and I'll show you model when I get back to class is that obviously we don't just have these big open walls we have to have what they call studs to give our house our wall rigidity and structure so, if you were to move over a little bit and not be at fiberglass and be at actual stud location, notice they're showing the 2x6 stud, which you see mostly here in the Midwest, but it does get colder. So, I like thicker walls for a higher R value. The stud would have an R value of 6.88. So, we would no longer have the fiberglass in our way anymore. We'd have the stud, stud instead. So, we need to find what the R value would be at a stud location. So we do that. So we have all the same numbers except for the instead of using 19 for the fiberglass, we have to use a 6.88 for the stud. Add all those up, and obviously we have a much lower R value in that section of the wall. Uh, of course, if you did it at a door or window, it'd be much lower than that because you tend to lose a lot of heat through doors and windows. Um, the next energy transfer system, radiation, we're going to write this down, is a process by which energy is transmitted through a medium, including empty space as electromagnetic waves. Stephen's Law, ob objects lose and gain thermal energy by electromagnetic radiation. You can get his equation right there and the variables. So P net is equal to, I believe that is stigma, or uh, sorry, not stigma, uh, sig sigma? Oh, I can't remember. Anyways, we'll just call it Stephen's constant. I don't have my Greek alphabet in front of me right now. But uh, Stephen's constant times A for area, and then E is the emissivity constant. And then you have, so this is where it gets tricky. This is temperature 2 
in Kelvin, but you have to put it to the fourth power, minus temperature one, again, in Kelvin, to the fourth power. So those are some very, very large numbers. Obviously, Stefan's constant, very small number. It's 5.6696 times 10 to the negative eight. That's watts per meter squared times Kelvin to the fourth. Um, and then we multiply that times area. And um, yeah, so that gives us P net. So we're going to see an example here in a second and see what this map looks like. Of course, most famous, most famous form of radiation is a microwave. That's how it cooks your food or heats up your food. So with electromagnetic waves transfer to food and other matter. So here's an example. This is progression for school. The student watches the morning weather, decide what clothes to wear. The bedroom is 65 degrees Fahrenheit, and the student's skin is 91.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Determine the net energy transfer from the student's body during the 15 minutes spent watching the morning weather. Note, skin emastivity is 0.9, and the surface area of the student is 1.3 meters squared. So, list all known values. We know the area of the student's exposed skin, which is 1.3 meters squared. The emissivity constant for skin is 0.9. Notice there's no units there. Stefan's constant we saw a minute ago, but 5.6696 times 10 to the negative 8. That's watts per meter squared times Kelvin to the fourth. Bedroom temperature is 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Her skin temperature is 91.4 degrees Fahrenheit. And the change in time is 15 minutes, but we have to have that in seconds. So that's going to be 900 seconds because there are 60 seconds in a minute. So then, not sure the bottom part shows up so quickly, but uh, list all known values, rate of energy transfer, and the energy transfer, P and Q. Select equations to solve unknown values. So we're going to use Stefan's equation and plug everything in. We're also going to use Q equals, uh, Q equals P times delta T. So known values, solve for uh, T2 to the fourth minus T1 to the fourth. So you see that down here finally. So we're going to take the 306 Kelvin. I'm um, sorry, let me back up. Here's the 91.4 degrees Fahrenheit. If you were to use conversions earlier we used, that comes out to 306 Kelvin. 65 degrees Fahrenheit, the room temperature, convert that to Kelvin is 291.33K. Take those two numbers, those 306K to the fourth, minus 291.33K to the fourth. You get these two big giant numbers, subtract them, and you get this big long number here. And that's K to the fourth. That's what we're going to plug in in this part of the equation up here. Okay? Um... And there's my conversion. I need to work on the my timing of these. I'm so sorry about that. I thought I fixed all this, and I obviously did not. So there's our temperature Fahrenheit, minus 32, divided by 1.8. So that gives us, um, and then plus 273, and that would give us our um, conversion over here to Kelvin. So sorry about that. Uh, but then we take our numbers, and we plug everything in. So we have the Stephens constant, 5.6696, times 10 negative 8, times 1.3 meters squared, the area of her skin times emissivity constant, 0.9, times the big long number we just found, using the Kelvins to the fourth, and that comes out to 103.95 watts. And once again, you think of that like a light bulb. So we combine the equations and solve. Q equals P times delta T. So we have the 103.95 watts times 900 seconds that she's sitting there, or 15 minutes. And that means that that was 93,555 joules. It's a lot of energy. Okay. So 93,500 joules of energy transferred from the student's body during the 15 minutes spent watching the morning weather. Uh, application thermal energy. So here, what we have here are these kind of these um, troughs. They're reflective shields. There's water pipes running behind them. So the energy is collected from the sun. It warms up those pipes and, of course, heats the water up. Here's a little drawing of one. Here's an actual picture of one. This is like a big dish, but same concept. It um, reflects all of energy and light into one source to help heat up water. Uh, this one is a bunch of mirrors in the ground. They all reflect light up into this tower up here, and then um, that tower has a, a, a pipe running through it with water, so it heats the water up. And this is a building here. I think it's an apartment complex, and basically what they're doing is they're using solar panels to heat up the building, but also to um, give them energy, electricity right there. So we can use it for lots of applications. Uh, here we actually have a swimming pool with a cover that's made to heat the pool up as it collects energy from the sun. Uh, of course, windows are good to, well, Two reasons. One, they let heat out, which is bad, but they let sunlight in on a bright sunny day. So on a cold day with lots of sun, that'll let uh, uh, that heat will come in, the light will come in, of course, heat the air up inside the building. That's nice. Uh, this is just solar panel once again, uh, used to collect energy and heat things. And then here, actually, naturally, you can use overhangs um, to shade houses, to shade the doors or these windows here, so it won't get as hot. So you might want the sun in in the morning when you first wake up to wake you up and have a nice you know, cup of coffee outside. But in the afternoon, when the, you want this area in the shade, that way it's a little bit cooler and that sun's not bearing down you and making your house too hot or that wall too hot. 
So we can do things uh, by construction wise or intentionally. Uh, sometimes things happen by accident. Uh, geothermal energy, you can write this down, energy generated from the thermal energy stored beneath the Earth's surface. Also refers to the heat that's collected from the atmosphere, for instance, near the oceans. Let's see, cooling tower over here that's used. And of course, you see actual natural geyser over here, or the uh, steam coming up from that hot water uh, with the Earth heated up. And that is it. Um, the subs should give you your packet, 1.3.3. Start working on that. And then it is not homework uh, because you'll probably have questions on it. And also, because when we do 1.3.4, there's going to be some downtime during that activity. So during that downtime, you will be able to work on 1.3.3. Uh, so start on 1.3.3. Uh, but it is not homework. If you have any questions, email me or send me your mind text. I'm so sorry I can't be there, but I hope to be there by Tuesday. Hopefully I'll get over this, uh, this, the flu and my ear infection. So thank you very much. Y'all have a good day and, uh, well, I'll see you later.